Chapter 30 of the Radio Boys on the Mexican Border by Gerald Breckenridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 30 Good News for Anxious Ears. Now to call father, said Big Bob. He and Jack, escorted by several Mexicans of Don Fernandez's band, who had been informed by the Don himself that the boys were friends who were to be treated with every respect, were approaching the radio station of the Calamares Ranch. Jack was exuberant. Plans for the rescue of his father from the stronghold of the rebel leader had not worked out just as proposed, yet the wild adventure upon which he and Bob had embarked had come to a successful conclusion after all, and he was correspondingly elated. Jack and his father were close pals, and he knew that Bob and his father were the same. He threw an arm over the shoulder of his chum. "'Your father will certainly be relieved,' he said. "'I imagine he's been sitting up there at the radio station on our ranch in New Mexico for hours, waiting to hear from you. I could just see him in there, walking up and down impatiently with that bow-legged old cowboy Dave Morningstar, tilted back in a chair with his hat down over his eyes, smoking and never making a move.' "'Won't he be delighted?' said Bob. "'Just won't he?' "'And Frank, too,' said Jack, thinking of their third chum left behind in the cave. "'Good old Frank,' said Bob warmly. "'We've got to tell him as soon as I've notified Father.' "'He certainly put up some fight, I'll bet,' said Jack, thinking of the hurried radio reaching them from the cave as they neared the Calamari's ranch in their airplane hours before. "'And maybe he was hurt in that fight with Morales. "'He said he licked the Mexican, but that was all we heard. "'You remember?' His voice was broken off after that. That's right, said Bob. I hope nothing serious happened to him. What a shame it would be if he was hurt, while we here came through practically without a scratch. All this time they had been walking across the starlit landing field where could be seen Bob's airplane, and now they drew near the brightly lighted radio station. Entering the sending room, they were confronted by Muller, that young German operator whose perspicacity almost had caused their undoing, and whom Jack earlier had floored with a blow on the chin, was sitting in a chair reading. He had returned to the station after the attack of the Mexican regulars had been beaten off. Muller jumped to his feet, surprise giving way to anger, but before he could draw and level the revolver swinging at his hip, one of the Mexican guards accompanying the boys pushed them aside and thrust himself forward. None of that, he said in Spanish. The general has commanded that these young Americans be well treated. They are friends. Friends, muttered Muller sullenly. Nevertheless, withdrawing his hand from the revolver butt. That wasn't a very friendly way to treat me a while ago, he turned to Jack. And why, if you are friends, he demanded, do you two appear in the closing of Herr von Arnheim and Captain Morales? A number of events have occurred, said Jack quietly. That is why. However, Don Fernandez has heard the tale, and that is sufficient. He has given orders personally to these soldiers that we shall be permitted to use the radio. That is why we are here. Is that so? demanded Muller of the Mexican guards. The spokesman of the pair nodded in agreement. The general has so commanded, he said. Grudgingly, Muller stepped aside. Here was a mystery, and he hated mysteries. Besides, these two youths were Americans. He was a German, and although the war between their respective countries was at an end, he could not bring himself to entertain kindly feelings toward them. Like many Germans, he believed the United States responsible for the defeat of his fatherland in the World War. He was working in the ranks of Germans in Mexico to embroil the United States with that country. Such war, he believed, would strike a blow in the prestige of the hated Yankees. If the general has commanded, he said, stepping aside, go ahead. Look here, said Jack, flushing at this grumpy attitude, but deciding to do the manly thing nevertheless, and extending his hand. Let bygones be bygones. After a moment's hesitation, Muller shook hands. To do him justice, it is only fair to point out that he was sincere in his attitude toward Americans, but misled. I haven't had time to explain about that blow, said Jack, but at the moment it was necessary. Matters have changed since then. It was nothing personal. Very well, said Muller, his grumpiness beginning to disappear beneath the charm of Jack's manner. Say no more. Now what is it that you want? Perhaps I can help you. We want to use the radio, said Jack, noting Bob's growing impatience at their delay. What station do you want to call? The Hampton Ranch, interrupted Bob, who decided it was time to bring this conversation to an end. He was in a hurry to talk to his father. Are you calling Rollins? 
This reminder of the erstwhile trader in the Hampton Ranch brought both boys to a realization that Muller was familiar with the manner of calling their station, as undoubtedly he had handled or conducted radio conversations with Rollins in the past. No, not Rollins, said Bob shortly. It was all right for Jack to shake hands with Muller if he wanted to. Jack and Muller had been active opponents, and such an act was only sportsmanlike under the circumstances. But Bob disliked the young German on sight. Just let me at the phone, he said, and turn on the juice. Very well. Muller turned stiffly and entered the power plant adjacent, while Bob, in a fever, adjusted the headpiece. As the hum of the machinery sounded from the power plant, Jack laid a hand on Bob's arm. Look here, Bob. Wait a minute. Bob regarded him inquiringly. His fingers reached for the knobs on the instrument box before him, preparatory to sending out a signal call. What is it now? Well, you know old Frank will have his ear glued to the receiver at the cave. Suppose you call your father, but tell Frank to listen in and not interrupt. Right, said Bob. Well, here goes. And he began calling the Hampton Ranch. End of chapter 30「Chapter Thirty One of the Radio Boys on the Mexican Border by Gerald Breckenridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirty One: The Calm After the Storm. Meanwhile, as Jack had foreseen, Mr. Temple waited at the radio plant at the Hampton Ranch with ill-concealed impatience. Dave Morningstar, hat pulled down over his eyes, sat in a chair tilted back against the wall, watching him from beneath the brim. The only signs of life about the ex-cowboy turned mechanic were the occasional movements of his eyes and the occasional refilling of his pipe, from which lazy streamers of smoke now and again floated upward. All the evening these two had held watch, and as hour after hour passed with no word from the boys, Mr. Temple's anxiety rose to a fever. He condemned himself for ever having given his consent to his son and Jack starting upon so foolhardy an expedition as that of attempting to rescue Jack's father from the rebel headquarters and fly to safety with him in Bob's airplane. Surely, he thought, the boys long since would have reached the ranch and made their departure. They had promised to call him by radio from the airplane the moment they started on their return flight. From their failure to do so, he had argued the worst. Their expedition must have come to grief. Probably even now they were prisoners. Perhaps, but he shuddered to think of the alternative. He would not let himself consider that possibility. In desperation, he turned to Dave Morningstar. Isn't there something we can do? He asked imploringly. The old ex-cowboy took his pipe from his mouth, spat deliberately to one side, and then brought the four legs of his chair to the floor. Let's see, he said. I've been a most asleep. Let's see. What say to call in the cave? Mr. Temple eagerly grasped at the proposal. Yes, certainly, he said. Why haven't I thought of that before? Perhaps Frank has heard something. He did not pause to consider that the party at the cave, in all likelihood, was little better prepared than he with information. The mere idea of doing something, of taking some action that would break up this horrible spell of waiting, appealed to him in his excited state. But after hearing from Frank an account not only of the fight the latter had had to recover the cave, after once having been dispossessed, but also of the attempt to warn the Calamari's ranch ahead of the boy's coming, which Morales had made, he began to wish he had never called Frank. Think of it, he said to Dave Morningstar after explaining the situation. In all likelihood, all of the clash of conversation in the air put them on guard at the Calamari's ranch. They were led to suspect all was not well. And then, when the boys landed, they were captured. That can be the only reason for our failure to hear from Bob and Jack. Dave attempted a sympathetic protest, but Mr. Temple shook his head and groaned. No, something has happened to them, he said. Oh, I was a fool to let them go. I'll never forgive myself. If only they were not injured. If only they were merely made prisoner, I... Hey, said Dave. Look at that single bob. Somebody's calling us. It's only Frank calling back, I suppose, groaned Mr. Temple. But Dave took up the headpiece and began adjusting the tuner knob. In a moment, he tapped Mr. Temple on the bowed shoulder. Listen here, he said, and clapped the headpiece over Mr. Temple's ears. Similar anxieties to those ruling the Hampton radio station had been in control at the cave during the evening hours. Frank had been frightfully anxious as the hours wore on with no word from the boys. The flight to the ranch was a short one, only fifty miles. Surely, if they had been successful, Jack and Bob, long ere this, would have called him by radio in accordance with their agreement. 
The poor boy stamped up and down the cave in such a fret that Tom Bodine and Roy Stone made repeated efforts to calm him, but without success. They began seriously to fear the effect of his anxiety upon his system, already fevered by the several hard fights through which he had gone in the last thirty-six hours. Mr. Temple's call had done nothing to assuage Frank's anxiety. If anything, it had increased it. As he put aside the headpiece, he looked so woebegone that Tom Bodine went up to him and laid an arm over his shoulder. "'Now look here, kid,' he began. But before he could proceed, Frank's glance caught the light flashing in the signal bulb, and he leaped to the headpiece and microphone with a glad cry. "'Father, we're all right. Mr. Hampton is freed.' At the cave in the mountains of Old Mexico, and at the Hampton Ranch across the border in American territory, these welcome words uttered in Bob's well-known voice were received with delight. Across mountain and desert sped the message by radio, modern science making possible the utilization of the forces of the air brought this quick relief to an anxiety that otherwise would have continued for hours at the least, until Bob and Jack could have flown back to the ranch. But neither Mr. Temple nor Frank took that thought into consideration. To them radio telephony was an accepted fact, part of their daily equipment for carrying on life. What filled their minds to the exclusion of all else was, at first, a sense of gratitude and thankfulness for the lucky outcome of the adventurous mission of the two boys, and, in the second place, a desire to learn the details. "'Now don't interrupt, Frank,' said Bob. "'Just listen while I talk to Father, and you can hear all about it.' Under this admonition, Frank ceased the flood of eager questions he had loosed and confined himself to listening. As the story of the remarkable series of adventures undergone by Jack and Bob at the Calamari's ranch poured through the air, however, Frank, at times, could not curb his quick tongue, and many an exclamation he let slip. His hand, placed across the mouth of the microphone, however, acted to prevent those exclamations from interrupting the flow of Bob's explanation. When Bob had finished his account, Jack took a turn, and at the recital of his adventures, Frank began to laugh. Removing his hand from the microphone, he interrupted his chum with the question, "'Now who's the lady killer?' Jack, who at the moment was telling of the part played by Senorita Rafaela, blushed violently and grew indignant. Bob, standing near, looked at him speculatively. Was old Jack hard hit by that little Spanish beauty? Ordinarily, Jack would have answered Frank's joking in kind, but to grow indignant, Bob feared his chum was smitten. For a long time the three-cornered conversation was carried on through the air, Mr. Temple and Frank both being eager to hear every detail and compelling Jack and Bob to repeat their stories several times. Finally drawn by the long absence of the boys, Mr. Hampton appeared at the radio station accompanied by Don Fernandez himself, and he and Mr. Temple held a brief conversation. At length it was decided that the next day Mr. Hampton with Bob and Jack would fly back to the Hampton Ranch in New Mexico. Frank, Tom, and Roy Stone were to ride for the border at the same time, after another night's sleep at the cave. Morales and von Arnheim, to whom Don Fernandez spoke personally, were apprised of the turn of affairs and were told to stay at the cave, which was plentifully provisioned until a relief party from headquarters could reach them with mounts. Then good nights were said, and at their three different points our prospective characters retired for the night, well pleased with the outcome of their adventures. End of chapter 31chapter thirty two of the radio boys on the mexican border by gerald breckinridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty two more adventure ahead farewell senor jack hampton jack clasped the sprightly spanish girl's hand reluctant to release it it was noon of the next day brilliant sunshine flooded the landing field of the calamares ranch bob already had clambered into the pilot's seat of the airplane Mr. Hampton stood to one side, exchanging farewells with Don Fernandez. "'Not farewell, senorita,' said Jack ardently. "'We must meet again.' The girl shrugged. "'But where?' said she. "'Will you come back to capture our castle again?' "'No,' said Jack, grinning. But he added significantly, "'I may come back to capture one of its inhabitants.' Low though his tone was, the words reached the ears of Dona Anna, the ever-present duena, and she glared at him. This was no way for a brash young Americano to be speaking to the daughter of the great Don Fernandez. Jack caught the glance and laughed. He turned to the duena and extended his hand. Farewell, Dona Anna, he said. It's been such a pleasure to meet you. The wizened old duena was nonplussed. 
She did not know whether to resent this pleasantry or be gratified by it. Mechanically, she accepted Jack's extended hand. At that moment, Bob called to him. Jack turned. Mr. Hampton already had entered the airplane. They were waiting for him. Once more, he seized Rafaela's hand. Remember, he said, so low that only her ears could hear his words, you haven't seen the last of me. She cast him an arch glance. Senor Jack is improving, she whispered. He will be a courtier yet. Then Jack climbed into his seat. A mechanic started the propeller. The machine began to bump over the ground, and presently it was in the air and climbing. Bob spiraled upward until they were high above the ranch, and the figures below seemed little mannequins. Jack believed he could distinguish Rafaela waving a lacy handkerchief, and leaned far over the side to wave in reply. Then they were off, zooming through the air, straight as an arrow for the international boundary and the Hampton Ranch beyond. The flight was brief. Bob covered the distance of a hundred and fifty miles in considerably less than two hours. Look here, he said to his father after greetings had been exchanged, and the latter had thumped his big son so hard and often that Bob dodged when further love taps came his way. I'm not going to stay here to be pounded into jelly. Tell you what, father, that's a long ride up here from the cave. Frank started early this morning, but he cannot arrive for another day. Suppose I go back and pick up him and Roy Stone and leave Tom to bring in the horses. Reluctant though he was to let his son depart so soon after regaining him, Mr. Temple was persuaded, and Bob set off, far down in old Mexico, back trailing over the route they had followed in entering the country. He saw three horsemen leading a fourth animal, and on approaching close saw that they were his friends. Landing near them, Bob called an explanation of his mission. Roy Stone demurred at the proposal. Much obliged for the offer, he said, but I'll ride along with Tom Bodine if it's all the same to you. I'm in no hurry to get anywhere, and you fellows will be having your own reunion at your ranch. Take your chum with you, but leave Tom and me. We'll be in with the horses sooner or later. Each of us will have a spare mount now, and it'll be an easy trip. Anyhow, I never did like those airplanes. Same here, said Tom Bodine, staring with awe at the machine. You couldn't get me in that thing on a bet. Frank accordingly relinquished the reins of his horse to Tom Bodine, and with goodbyes to his friends, clambered into the airplane with Bob. Roy Stone obligingly spun the propeller, an accomplishment with which his association with von Arnheim had made him familiar, and once more the plane soared upward and headed across the border. At the ranch that night it was a jolly party that gathered around the board, with Mr. Hampton, Mr. Temple, and the three boys. Gabby Pete, talkative as ever, was bursting with desire for information about their adventures. He had prepared a surprisingly good dinner in honor of the occasion. Rollins alone was not present. When told of Mr. Hampton's impending arrival, he had begged Mr. Temple to let him go to a distant oil well for several days until Mr. Hampton could be informed in detail of his treachery in the past and the reason for it. This Mr. Temple had agreed to. Back and forth across the table flew the conversation, and when the meal was at an end, all continued to sit around the table until a late hour. During the weeks that followed, Bob and Frank spent many enjoyable hours rambling on horseback over the surrounding country and taking more extended trips by airplane. The love for the country of which Jack had spoken on arrival seized them, too. The bright hot days succeeded by cool nights, for in New Mexico the air cools immediately upon the setting of the sun, appealed powerfully to the boys reared on the sea coast. The absence of raw winds and fogs especially appealed to them. The weather was something which could be counted upon. Every day was fair. So passed the weeks, with the boys under Jack's pilotage traveling far and wide, scouting through the mountains to discover new beauties of scenery, making visits to the ancient Spanish ruins at Santa Fe, attending a rodeo at Gallup, to which came cowboys and cowgirls from a vast stretch of territory to perform hair-raising feats of horsemanship and exhibit well-nigh miraculous skill with the lasso. A month after their advent, and when their summer vacation was not yet half spent, Mr. Temple at dinner one night announced that before ending his prolonged vacation for business, the first he had taken in ten years, he planned to go to San Francisco to consult with a manager of his western exporting office. Why, father, said Bob, I've always wanted to see the city by the Golden Gate, and I know the fellows feel the same way about it. What do you say to taking us with you? We won't get in your way, and you can drop us here on your way back east. Smilingly, Mr. Temple gazed at the faces of the three eager boys. Jack and Frank enthusiastically echoed their chum's appeal. Yes, do, Mr. Temple, said Jack. That is, if we wouldn't be in your way. Uncle, I'm crazy to see San Francisco, said Frank. 
well it's a good deal changed from the days of the forty niners said mr temple smiling you may have your hopes too high and may be disappointed oh come now father said bob if you're going to be there only a week it'll be worth while for us well that's the length of time i plan to stay said mr temple thoughtfully but i'll be pretty busy while i'm there do you boys feel you can keep out of mischief if left to yourselves mr hampton interrupted i reckon they can temple he said they saved the day for me i'm beginning to think they're a pretty self-reliant lot if you can see your way to doing so take them along the trip will be a fine experience all right boys said mr temple but you'll have to leave your airplane if you're going to see san francisco you can't do it very well by airplane and anyhow i wouldn't care to see you tackle the rockies all right father agreed bob we'll be too busy seeing the sights to want the plane anyhow when do we start in two days said his father with this we take leave of the three chums whose adventures on the mexican border have come to a successful conclusion but in the next story of the radio boys on secret service duty we shall follow their further adventures after they reach the city by the golden gate adventures fully as thrilling as those on the mexican border in which they become drawn into the plots of an international gang of smugglers engaged in bringing chinese coolies into the united states in defiance of the exclusion laws the end end of chapter thirty two read by chris thompson end of the radio boys on the mexican border by gerald breckinridge